are here tonight for our program on Anna or Annie J. Evans. And um, she was Attleboro's first female police officer and African-American officer. She did make a little debut. She was a part of the Neighbors in Dialogue discussion in 2021. And she was also an honoree for the 2021 Juneteenth celebration. Part of what I'm gonna talk about tonight is not just Annie, but it's also a little bit of my research process. And usually when I research somebody, I am looking specifically to research someone, something. And Annie kind of fell in a little differently, and that was thanks to COVID. So sitting at home, stuck at home, using my computer, researching, doing whatever I can to keep myself occupied, I went on to the Library of Congress's um, site called Chronicling America. So this is a free digital repository that the Library of Congress has, and they're constantly adding things to it. And so if it's free, it's for me. And so I'm always looking for ways that I can research, find things. And I put in my little search for Attleboro and started going through my hits to see what I would find. And lo and behold, I came across this um, announcement for Mrs. A.J. Evans, a colored woman at Attleboro, Mass, has been appointed the first policewoman by Mayor P.E. Brady. And I don't know if you can see the date down there, but it was 1921 that this was in the paper, and it was in a Seattle, Washington paper. So I don't know much about the Attleboro police force, the history behind it, but I thought having a woman police officer and an African-American police officer in 1920 was pretty progressive. And um, so I was like, all right, I gotta find out more about her. Unfortunately, I don't know too much about her early history, but I will share with you as much as I have and um, we'll try to fill in some gaps if anybody knows more and maybe by doing this program, we'll find out a little bit more about here. So Anna J. Landon or London, I found her maiden name spelled a few different ways, um, was born in Augusta County, Virginia in 1859. Um, I don't know much about her, her backstory, but I do know that the Civil War was imminent. So this is 19, 1859 that she's born. And um, by the end of the Civil War, 1865, she's just about six years old. In 1875, she marries William Evans, and he was born in nearby Cumberland County, Virginia. And together, Annie and William would have six children. Their two oldest children, Mary, was born in 1876, and Aurora was born in 1878. They were both born in Virginia. At some point between 1878 and 1884, the family begins to move north, and I know this because their next two children, Luna, who was born in 1882, and John, who was born in 1884, were both born in New Jersey and baptized in Trenton, New Jersey. Annie. William and their four oldest children are also enumerated in the 1865 New Jersey census. So every 10 years you have a federal census and most states every five years that in between five years they do um, a state census. And so the small family or growing family, I guess I should say four kids is in New Jersey in 1885. But by 1886, the family has arrived in Attleboro. Their two youngest daughters, Ethel, is born in 1886, and Alice is born in 1893. Now, the few previous documents that I had, those are from Ancestry, uh, subscription-based. The library does have access to Ancestry at Attleboro Public Library if you don't have the paid subscription. But that lower document is from one of the town records. And there are 111 of Attleboro's town reports that have been digitized and they are available on the internet archive. Um, and you can get through that link through the Attleboro Public Library sites. And the nice thing about them is you can search them. So you don't have to read through all of them. You can search them for keywords, which makes that digitization process so valuable when you're researching. So instead of going through 111 documents, you put in your keywords and you see what you can find. And so near the bottom there is Alice Ruth Evans, born on February 28th. So at first the family is living on South Main Street, somewhere near, I'll say where Morin's is today, um, but those were houses back in the day. But by 1894, Annie and William are living at 22 Bank Street, 
where they would remain for the next, or Annie would remain for the next 40 years. So I'm not sure if you can make out where we are, but here's North Main and Park, so the middle of town. And then here's Bank Street, so this building today is Santander Bank. And then their block is where the um, public parking garage is today. So just to kind of give you some context, and right about where number five is, is where our beloved Academy building is. So these are Sanborn fire insurance maps, and this is also available, or many of them are available on the Library of Congress website. Again, they've been digitized, so it just makes them that much easier to look at, and then you can take screenshots of them, you can look at um, different years. And so the maps themselves, there are many, many pages, they're a large format. The yellow color means that that was a wood frame structure. If it has an X through it, like this building, it means it was an outbuilding. And if it's a pink building like this, it means it was made out of brick. And these teal green colors, those are fireproof buildings, brick tiles, a little bit more of a fireproof building. So this is what that block looked like in 1894 when the Evans family first moves there. So William's occupation, through much of the documentation is either as a farmer or a teamster. Annie's work experience is a little bit more varied, so she's most often listen, listed as a laundress. The 1910 census has her listed as a stenographer. I, haven't, I don't have any other support documentation from that. And we know at least from 1920 to 1925 that she's also one of the special police officers in Attleboro. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So this is a picture of Bank Street. This is from a donation to the Historical Society collection. So this is from 1895. So this is Bank Street right down the middle. So again, this building is where Santander Bank would be today. If you see this brick building here, that's the Bates Opera House. You can just see the tower of the Sanford Street School kind of sneaking up there. And then this other tower is the high school at the corner of Bank Street. Uh, that's about where the Florence Haywood Sweet Memorial YMCA building is today. If you look here, it's a little hard to see in this light. You can just see some laundry hanging out there. That's not Annie's yard, but it is kind of apropos that there's some laundry hanging in there. And if you just sneak through these houses here, this ridge line would be Annie's house at 22 Bank Street. So this area has changed quite a bit in the last 100 years. So this postcard is still looking down Bank Street now. And so you can see the dirt road. We've got some nice sidewalks along the side. This is that corner building at the corner of Park and Bank. And then you can see these two houses. And about where this big tree is is where Annie's house would have been. Across the street is this four-story building. That's the Odd Fellows building in the last hundred years. So this postcard is still looking down Bank Street now. And so you can see the dirt road. We've got some nice sidewalks along the side. This is that corner building at the corner of Park and Bank. And then you can see these two houses. And about where this big tree is is where Annie's house would have been. Across the street is this four-story building. That's the Odd Fellows building. So keep your eye on that Odd Fellows building for the next image. So here it is again, that four-story building, and that was owned or utilized by the Attleboro um, Daily Sun. On the opposite side of the street, there's a laundry shop here. And again, based on the documentation, it doesn't look like this is where Annie worked. But it is kind of interesting that just a couple of blocks away, she had um, laundry, but does look like she's working out of her home doing laundry. And then we've got the Columbia Theater next door. Now, if you look at this arch in the window and these coinings, they're a little hard to see, these little squares at the corner. Here's a modern picture of Bank Street. In 1968, there was a terrible fire in the Odd Fellows building. And so the top three stories were demolished and they were able to save the first story. So here's that kind of arched window again. Here's the, the little blocks, the coining along the edges. And so now when you look back at this postcard, you can see what that building once was. 
The Oddfellows, the 1896 Oddfellows construction cornerstone is still on the building. So when you walk by the door, you can still see the Oddfellows um, building. All right, I know I've kind of taken you on a little detour of town, so we'll look at one more map to kind of set that stage of where we are. So here's Park Street in South Main, and then it heads to North Main. Here's the Bates Opera House downtown, and here's Bank Street. The Evans family lived again at 22 Bank Street for over 40 years. Here's the AME Church at the corner of Leroy and Bicknell, where Annie and her family attended and were, were very um, active members. I just like to point out the Academy whenever I get a chance. So here's Schoolhouse Hill and the Academy building behind the Y today that's still there. And then almost getting cut off the screen, this is us. This is the museum over on Union Street where you sit tonight. So just to kind of give you an idea of that center part of town where Annie's working, where her kids are going to school, here's her church and our host for the evening. So this is the 1895 Massachusetts Atlas or Atlas of Massachusetts. This is another resource that's available digitally um, through the Massachusetts State Library. So again, these are some of my favorite spots to go to when I research. So here's that map again, 1894 Sanborn of where Annie's house is. So keep an eye on kind of Academy, the street across from her. And by 1916, that whole alleyway of Academy Street, where now we have the Attleboro Sun and the Odd Fellows building is there. This whole stretch of buildings is there. And so Attleboro is really starting to grow. So remember in 1887, we split from North Attleboro. So our population kind of literally gets cut in half. And then by, so that's about 7,500 in 1890. By 1900, we're already up to a little over 11,000 people. In 1910, we're at 16,000 people. And so in 1914, when we become a city, we're just a little bit over 18,000 people. So in 20 years, we've gone up you know, 12,000 people. So the city is really growing. All right, so now back to Annie. Annie was a very active woman, so she was active um, at the AME Zion Church. Um, she was part of fundraising efforts to insist, assist in paying off the church debts. She organized and participated in throwing donkey parties, which as near as I can figure out is a giant pin the tail on the donkey with an actual donkey in your yard. Um, she was part of a variety of programs, hostessing, um, helping out, running things. She was in sewing circles. She was teaching Sunday school. She was helping to organize bazaars and throwing lawn parties, again, as fundraisers for the church, just to name a few. Annie's footprint is very deep in the historical record, which again, for one of, I would say, Attleboro's um, forgotten uh, people is pretty important because this is what helps me to kind of find all the little threads and piece together her story. She's also a very active member of fraternal, or, uh, fraternal organizations. So I mentioned she's across the street from the Odd Fellows. They also have a Grand United Order of Odd Fellows, which is a little bit different than the Independent Odd Fellows, although they use their building. This particular group functioned as a mutual aid society, um, kind of like insurance for African Americans. She attended meetings as a delegate in Virginia, in Worcester, in Detroit, Michigan, um, she's also um, in the Order of Good Samaritans, and she's also a member of the J.R. Giddings and Jollifee Union, which is another fraternal benevolent organization for African American women. And I just keep in mind, this is early 1900s, a mother of six traveling at the turn of the century. Like I just, you know, incredible. So most of these are from the Pawtucket Times, and so the Pawtucket Times has already digitized their collection. So the Pawtucket Public Library has um, a link on their website where you can search the newspaper. Again, invaluable to finding these because I don't know if you've ever tried to look through microfilm, but if I had to look through microfilm and find all of these pieces, it would have been impossible. It, you, you know, you got, maybe I would have found one 
I mean, looking at the writing, how small everything is, how crazy microfilm is. And so you're able to search them. And I am very happy to say that the Attleboro Public Library is in the process of digitizing the Attleboro Sun. Right now they've got um, online 1945 to 1969. So they're not quite as far back as Annie yet, but as soon as they get back into um, the early 1900s, I'm sure I'll find a bunch more. The Pawtucket Times had an interesting relationship with Attleboro, especially South Attleboro. They reported on the Attleboros in the paper, but the Sun will just have that much more um, information because it's the local newspaper. But what I consider her biggest achievement, other than being the first police officer, was that she was a delegate and board member for the Independent Order of St. Luke. The Independent Order of St. Luke was founded by a former slave, Mary Prout, in 1867. And St. Luke was designed as, again, another mutual aid society. Today, we'd call it insurance. So the order, order offered insurance to African-American Christians at a low cost and primarily to be used in a case of illness or injury or for burial costs. And Annie is on their board for quite some time. Now, the Independent Order of St. Luke's is also famous um, for Maggie L. Walker. Um, this picture and all the pictures that I have are courtesy of the Maggie Leaner Walker National Historic Site in Virginia. Um, I don't have any pictures locally or, or of Annie, so I'm very thankful that the museum was able to uh, send me over a few pictures. So Maggie Leaner Walker is, will later become the president of the Independent Order of St. Luke's, and she will become the first African-American female bank president and she institutes a lot of new initiatives for St. Luke's. Headquartered in Richmond, Virginia, they later offered savings and loans as part of their programs, and they're famous for educating and encouraging young um, children to begin saving, and their name kind of becomes synonymous with these penny-saving banks, literally putting a penny away and saving penny by penny. So Annie is a delegate a, an executive board member, a trustee for the Independent Order of St. Luke's from about 1909 to 1927. And so through the years, she represents them again in Virginia, throughout the country um, as an executive board member. And then from 1926 to 1927, she'll um, become a trustee of the organization. Um, it never really says she works directly with Maggie Leaner Walker, but Maggie Leaner Walker is the president while she is one of the executive board members, so I presume that she was an acquaintance of Maggie Walker, if not maybe even a friend. And unfortunately, no life is without its hardships, and so uh, during, during Annie's lifetime, uh, she had a lot of grief and hardship, and in 1900, she loses her first daughter, Luna, um, at just 17 years old. In 1907, her granddaughter, Thelma, would die at the age of five, and a few months later, Thelma's mother, Annie's daughter, Aurora, would also die just before her 30th birthday. In 1914, Annie's oldest daughter, Mary, would return um, home after um, a separation and divorce. And in 1916, Annie loses her husband, uh, William. Annie's uh, son, John, is um, a member of the 1902 Attleboro High School football team. He is the only other member of the family that I have a picture of. Um, Interestingly about his life, I did find an article that he was apprehended for being a stubborn child in 1901. Now the stubborn child law was an actual law on the books. It's a little archaic, but it could mean anything from disobeying your parents to cutting school to more nefarious acts. And in 1901, his lawyer is Philip Brady, and he's who will elect or appoint Annie as the first policewoman uh, 20 years later. Annie is cited in the 2019 book called Banking on Freedom. It's by Shanette Garrett Scott. And um, what's interesting about her, her 
reason for being in this book is that she was denied a loan in 1910 from the very organization that she was working with, from St. Luke's. So while she's an active member delegate on the executive board, they deny her application for a loan. And Annie writes a, I will call it a curt e a message, not an email, <laughs> a message to them apologizing for all her hard work and um, the fact that they rejected her when she feels that um, she worked tirelessly for them building up the work of the organization. Uh, this book I was able to get on interlibrary loan, so I didn't have to purchase it. My apologies, um, Shanette. But um, it's kind of interesting the way the organization was and wasn't approving loans, so even one of their board members um, didn't meet their stringent qualifications. And what I think is going on is in 1909, Annie and William purchased a lot of land on Holman Street. So I've got some land transfers between Annie and William and Robert and Edward Slater. By, eight, by 1916, the land is um, then sold back to the, to the Slaters. And I believe in her 1910 loan was to build a home on this property. So she bought the land, tried to get a loan to build the house, and wasn't able to do that. And then in the meantime, after um, William's death, she sells the property back to the Holman family. I'm not sure if the Slater name is ringing any bells for anybody on Holman, but Robert Slater was an African-American who worked at first for Sidney Bigney um, as a domestic servant. Later, he works at Highland Country Club. Um, and then later, he opens his own catering business and ice cream shop on Holman Street. And so I believe that was still open into the 60s. I don't know how much later it is than that, but I've heard tale of many going there for ice cream. Uh, the Registry of Deeds, the Taunton Registry of Deeds, has also digitized their entire collection. So parts of that are available online for you to download, and then other parts of it, you, you can still view the deeds and mortgages, but then if you want them without watermarks, you, you can purchase them. But you can search them, and you can read the deed documents, you can look at the transfers, and kind of do that part of the tracing. So that's another really valuable research when you're looking to see who owned the property and kind of try start to figure out some of these um, connections. All right, so uh, Holman Street and Emory are the two kind of long streets coming off of, uh, is that park? No, what is that? Is that park? Pleasant? What is that corner? That's Pleasant at the corner. So here's Holman, here's matching Emory. Um, Pleasant Street would be down here. So here's the lot of land that Annie was, had purchased and I believe was attempting to build a home on. And that lot is still empty today. All right, back to Annie and being a police officer. So in December of 1920, Philip Brady, who's the current mayor at the time, um, appoints Annie as Attleboro's first police, female police officer. And she is a special police. She is not a police matron. That's going to come up later. Um, Boston was actually the first city in the country to appoint a police matron in 1883. And by 1888, Massachusetts had made it a law that if you were a city or a town over 20,000 people, you needed a female a police matron to tend to the women. So um, there would be women guards, women police officers attending to women prisoners. Um, it was actually uh, the um, Women's Temperance, Temperance Christian Union who was really a big proponent about getting um, the women police matrons in there. So they're not just teetotalers, you know, trying to get everyone to stop drinking. They're also involved in health and um, other services for women throughout the country. So. Annie Evans is um, appointed the first special police officer. That's a female, and I love the, the byline. New, eager, new officer eager to clean up dance halls by warning erring couples. She says she will carry a gun. Um, it's really hard to read a lot of the fine print, so I'll just give you some highlights. In the article, it mentions that she doesn't look 40. 
um, but confesses that she's already 60. So at 60, she had just turned 60, she's uh, working as a special police officer. Um, she requested the mayor to work as a special police officer. She went to Mayor Brady and um, requested to be appointed a police officer. And she, one of her, her things she was targeting were the dances, and I quote, they are the most vulgar things I ever saw with their shimmy, bunny hug, and other such varieties. I tried really hard to find a clip of the bunny hug. Um, and at the time, uh, they called them the animal dances. So the fox trot, the grizzly bear, the turkey trot, the bunny hug were a little too close for most people. So they were a little more loose in their shaking, and they were a little too close for the couples who were dancing them. And Annie did not approve. Um, she does explicitly say that she is not doing this because of complaints against um, the African-American community, but she is honored to be um, the first of about 2,600 women in Attleboro, so 2,600 women voters. So again, this is 1920. The um, 19th Amendment just had passed and had been ratified in 1920, so just prior to her appointment. And now the women of Attleboro are also eligible, eligible to vote in the first election in December of 1920. So Annie is appointed December 9th, and then December 15th is a mayoral election in 1920. Um, she did also state that she would carry a billy club and a gun. I don't know if she ever needed to use them. I didn't find anything on that. So of course, no appointment is without controversy. And so the next day, those very same um, women's Christian temperance union ladies are up in arms. They wish Annie success. It's not against Annie, but they were not happy with Mayor Brady. It seems the year before they had gone, come to Mayor Brady and asked them to appoint a female police matron as part of this mission that the temperance union has. And they told, he told them no. So they were mad that the mayor had denied them, but then had appointed um, this woman. And so, uh, they felt sure that Annie's qualifications were good, but they were a little ticked off at Mayor Brady. Now, in the same article at the end of it, it's a little hard to see down here, um, Annie also has a rebuttal. And so she wanted to make it clear that um, her appointment by Brady as a special policewoman was her own request from personal observation among her own people with no thought of serving any other. I do hope my appointment will not stir up any race hatred from which our city is free. So she wanted to make it clear that her work would be with the African American, the colored community in town. So the mayor is not happy with the women's temperance union and so he writes a rebuttal on the next day telling them the difference. So again, these nuances, and I'm sure local government is no different today. A police matron is an appointed, a paid city position, and he cannot appoint one of those. She must be hired by the city, she's paid by the city. However, the special police officers, he can appoint, and they are not paid by the city, they are paid by the organizations that hire them. So kind of like a sp special police detail today where you would hire a police officer to do parking or to work your bazaar. They would hire police officers to work the mills. They would hire them to work the dances. They would hire them to work the events. But these were special police officers. And when Annie was appointed special police officer in 1910, she's the only female. The other 40 special police officers are all men. And then the African-American community also sends in a rebuttal. They're not very happy with Annie. So they don't need anybody watching them. They don't need anybody policing their, um, their dances. And so uh, the colored people of Attleboro did not ask for a special police. There's certainly no need for it. I'm paraphrasing from the article. The law requires that all public dances have an officer, so they think it's unnecessary expense to go and have uh, the secondary person there, and that the dances given by the colored people are among the most orderly and best conducted dances given in the city. And it signed one of the people. 
So Annie is first appointed by Mayor Brady in 1920, and she's reappointed. He does win re-election. My apologies, I did want to point out Eliza's Daggett run for mayor. Eliza Daggett is the first female to run for mayor in Attleboro. She does not win. Uh, there are actually five people in the race, and Mayor Brady wins re-election again. So she's first appointed by Philip Brady, and then she is reappointed when uh, Mayor Sweeney comes into office in 1923, 24, and 25. Um, she does work dances. She does guard female prisoners, which I find interesting because they made that nuanced difference between matron and police officer. And um, so I don't know how she was paid, but uh, she worked at the hospital. She would go to Sturdy if there was a female prisoner that needed guarding there and at the station. And sadly, in November 1936, at just 77 years old, um, Annie Evans dies. Her obituary mentions her service as the first female police officer, but none of those other accomplishments. She's survived at this point by three of her children, although two of them, John and Mary, would only outlive her by another four years. So by 1940, there's just one living um, of the Evans children. Annie and her family are buried at Woodlawn Cemetery here in town. Um, I've traced the family tree as best I can. Um, I'm still searching for some living family members, more photos, more information. So if you know of any, if you have any, please feel free to contact me. Um, of course, I'm writing her story in retrospect, so I'm sure I've made some errors. So my apologies and any corrections or any information people have is um, greatly accepted. Um, I also encourage anybody researching to start trying to use some of those digital documents, even if it's to kind of get your trip in order before you go somewhere. But it's amazing how much more is being digitized all the time. And again, I'll put another plug in for the Attleboro Public Library. Their local history room is amazing. They are currently digitizing the Attleboro Sun, and it's going to make research amazing. So here's the tree that I have for Annie and her family. Her oldest daughter, Mary, that divorces and lives with her most of her adult life, um, does not have any children. Her daughter, Aurora and um, Thel uh, Thelma, are the ones that, um, Thelma dies at just five years old, and then Aurora, not much longer, just within a few months at just the age of 29. Uh, Luna is the daughter that died at 17, so she never marries or has children. John is married twice. Um, he does have a daughter, Maud, who has just recently passed, well, I feel like it's recent, but passed away not that long ago, but I wasn't able to find any living family or connections. She moved out of the area, and I just, I couldn't trace it. And then um, Ethel, it appears, has two sons, also found it very difficult to trace them. And Alice's daughter, Vivian, actually goes to live with um, uh, Annie and Mary while they're living still at um, Bank Street. And then I, I, I lose touch of Vivian. Uh, she graduates from Attleboro High School and then seems to leave the area. So um, I was unable to really trace current family members. So again, if anybody has any information, I would love it. All right, hope I did Annie justice. Well, good night, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm glad to tell Annie's story. and. Um, I hope that if you have any questions, you'll ask me, contact me. 